And we're going to start off with an experiment. So I want everyone to get a partner, and I want you to decide who will be partner A and who will be partner B. Go. Now I know some of you are probably going, no one told me about this partner crap. I didn't want to have to do that. And I can already tell your personality style because type A personalities are usually the ones that say, I'll be A. <laughs> and type B personalities are going, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> All right, now partner A, I want you to make a fist as tight as you can. Make a fist, partner A. Partner B. Partner B. Duck. No, I'm okay. kidding. All right, partner A, make a fist as tight as you can. Partner B, you have three seconds Get it open, go! <laughs> now I have a question for you. I have a question. Partner A, when partner B tried to open your hand, what did you do? Tightened it. And when you tightened it, partner B, what did you do? Pulled harder. Now here's what I find fascinating. I mean, I know I have some psychology majors who were like, please open your hand. And the other person was like, how did that make you feel? And, but why did you resist? I never told partner A not to let partner B open your hand. Why did you resist? It's because we react. We react to people, we react to situations, we react to circumstances. I can prove it. By a show of hands, how many of you have received a phone call in the last couple of weeks where you looked at the caller ID and just went, ugh? <laughs> Anybody? Anyone? Don't point if they're in your row. Don't point. We react, and the problem is that when we react, we are relinquishing control. We are letting other people, other circumstances dictate our response, and when we give away that power, we give away our opportunity to stay resilient. <laughs> All right, now I want you to cross your arms. All right. Now cross them in the opposite direction. Which way was more awkward singing the alphabet, the first or the second? Second. Which way was more awkward crossing your arms, the first or the second? And that is because we are creatures of habit. Our brain depends on habits because it means it doesn't have to work that hard. In fact, over 40% of everything you do every single day is a habit. And our brain does this and it relies on those, but the problem is it doesn't know the difference between a good habit or a bad habit. It just takes anything we repeatedly think, say, or do and converts it into an automatic so that we can rest, so that our prefrontal cortex, our executive functioning skills, our problem solving skills can rest. And it goes to the part of our brain that is just on automatic. My question for you would be, which habits are supporting your success and which habits are sabotaging your success? If we are not happy with the results in our life, it boils down to two choices. One, we can change the way we think and behave to get a different result, or we can settle for the result we get based on how we think and behave. It doesn't work any other way. But then was my favorite part because he goes, Anne, you're going to help me do a total 360. Now, I'm no math buff, 
doesn't that mean he's gonna end up right back where he is? Like, I'm not sure if I was a big help there. I'm not so sure. And here's the thing, resilience, I used to think it was in your genetics, like skinny thighs. You either have it or you don't. But what I have come to appreciate is that resilience is a set of skills that can be practiced and honed. And whether we like it or not, life gives us plenty of chances to practice. Now, people will come up to me and say, you know, I've got a situation at home, but it's nothing compared to yours. That is called comparative suffering, and it's an exercise in futility. We all struggle at 100%. It's all relative. Now, I know some people who have a permanent seat on the struggle bus, but we all struggle 100%. And what works for one person to, to build resilience might not necessarily work for another person to build resilience. So just because your friend swears by hot yoga and kale smoothies, that does not mean it's gonna work for you. And speaking of that, we gotta talk about kale. It's like hairy spinach, right? It just, it reminds me of wet sadness. <laughs> and my girlfriend's like, you gotta try kale chips. They taste just like chips. And I'm like, yeah, if you've never tried chips. <laughs> People who love kale have clearly never tried bacon. <laughs> what I think has changed is our relationship with the stressor. We no longer are able to remove ourselves from it. We've become addicted to it. Because here's what happens. When you are under stress, when you are under pressure, and it doesn't matter whether it's a saber-toothed tiger or a snarky email from your colleague. It doesn't matter. The same threat still makes your brain go into the same protection mode. And it was originally so we could fight or run away or freeze. But what ends up happening is it shuts down our ability to think straight. So when you are under stress, you are flooded with cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline and norepinephrine and all of those chemicals flood your system. And we have spent so much time in that state that I believe we have become addicted to it. We don't know what to do in absence of it. Part of it, I think, is our relationship with technology. How many of you have a phone on you right now? How many of you sleep with it by your bed? Oh, come on, raise your hands. You know you do. And what's the reason you do it? Because it has an alarm clock. Did you know they make alarm clocks? <laughs> yeah, I just figured that out. They do. They make alarm clocks. 70% of Americans sleep with their phone next to their bed. 3% sleep with it in their hand. I guess it takes too long to go, hello? And we need to go, hello. Right? But think about it. Facebook, social media, Twitter, it's one of the leading causes of depression and anxiety in adolescence. Right? We compare ourselves to everybody else, and nobody posts the crappy stuff. You'll see, today I'll post a Facebook Live video, I'll talk about how amazing you are, I'll be all dressed up. What you didn't see is yesterday at 4 a.m. How many of you have pets? All right, so you know there is no sound that will wake you out of a dead sleep faster than this one. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, you could be in the middle of a great dream and you hear one and it's all over. And it's always under the bed and it's always on carpet. I mean, that's just the way it goes, right? But you won't see me posting that. You won't see me after a knockdown, drag out, three hour tantrum with Evan where windows are broken and holes are in sheetrock. You won't see me post that when I've been crying for four days because we're in a manic episode. You won't see me post that. We compare ourselves to other people, and when we don't feel we measure up, we feel like we've done something wrong, right? Our world means we have to find a way to turn ourselves off and put ourselves in airplane mode. Think about it. The United States has 50 to 70 million people with a sleep or wakefulness disorder, so much so it's been named a public health epidemic by the CDC. 
We're exhausted, we're burned out, and we think, well, I'll sleep when I'm dead. What do you do when your phone battery is at 10%? You're like a mouse looking for cheese, trying to find an outlet, you're like. Right? What do you do when you're on 10%? I'll sleep during winter break. Right? We've got to find a way to turn ourselves off so that we can recharge. And that means we have to take care of ourselves. So my mom is a flight attendant. And she was a court reporter for 30 years. And when she was 51, she decided to become a flight attendant. Now, I'm not supposed to tell you what airlines, so we'll just call it Southwest. <laughs> And she is the cool one who makes those great announcements. And she says stuff like, in case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, please place on your mask and then assist your child. And if you're traveling with more than one child, please pick your favorite or the one with the most potential. <laughs> so we're getting ready for our RV trip. And he says, Anne, I've only got one request. I want to go without the dogs. I don't want anything that's going to lick me jump in my lap, pant, or drool. And I was like, well, there goes my evening. <laughs> so we went without the dogs, and it was wonderful. But the best part of it was when we got into the mountains, we had no cell service. And for about 15 minutes, I panicked. I mean, I was really freaking out. What if someone needs to get a hold of us? And then I thought, you know what? Everyone will live. Everyone will survive. And we had 48 hours without a connection to any technology, and it was the most liberating 48 hours I can possibly imagine. When was the last time you turned all of your screens off for 48 hours? Seems impossible, doesn't it? But when you don't have a choice, you do it. And it ended up being the most amazing feeling. So sometimes we just have to disconnect. We have to put ourselves in airplane mode. Because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for us. And part of taking care of yourself is understanding what your true priorities are. So I swim. And I swim where there are lines painted on the bottom of the pool. Why do they do that? Yeah, because the other swimmers don't like it when I come visit. And they help me go in a straight line. Well, how many of you have ever swam in an ocean or in a lake or anywhere else in open water? What happens if you try to swim in a straight line? The current carries you away. And so people will say, you know what? If you swim in the ocean, find an object, find a buoy, find a lighthouse. So my question is, what is your lighthouse? What is it that you are aiming for? Because most of us just think, you know what, if I keep my head down and work harder, I'll be successful. But then we look up and 10 or 15 years has gone by, and we may or may not be anywhere closer to meeting our goals. Gravity has taken over, but we may not be any closer. What's the one time of year we set goals? New Year's. I'm going to not drink so much. I'm going to be a better friend. I'm going to go to the gym. No more burgers. By January 10th, we have a cheeseburger in one hand, a beer in the other. We went to the gym. That hurt. I'm not doing that again. And we are right back to where we started. And people talk about work-life balance, and I don't think that's real. I think it's a mirage. We're chasing something that doesn't exist. Work-life balance means you are clear on your priorities, and you spend your time there without apologizing for it. It means you figure out what's most important to you and you schedule it. Because I don't know about you, but if it's not in my calendar, it doesn't get done. What do you wish you had more time for? And where is that scheduled in your calendar? So here's what I do. Once a month, I sit down and have a glass or four of wine. And <laughs> I'm joking. It's vodka. So I sit down and I figure out what my goals are. Now, I don't set one for every single area, but I pick one area and I focus on it for the month. And I try to figure out what is going to get me closer to my lighthouse, because if it's not, I'm wasting my time. If it is not something that's going to get me further toward reaching my goal, then it isn't worth it. 
And that's what we have to figure out. What is our lighthouse? What is it we're excited about? What is it we want for our life? How do we define success? Because if not, we just end up where we're headed and hope we've landed in the right place and then we draw a bullseye around ourselves and go, okay, cool, right? So taking care of yourself, huge resilience building strategy. So here's what's fascinating about gratitude. We think it's touchy feely, but it's been proven to be the number one predictor of well-being and determination of resilience. It tamps down your stress response by 23%. It reduces cortisol by 23%. And what's fascinating is that you don't even have to find anything to be grateful for. The simple act of looking releases serotonin and dopamine, the feel-good neurotransmitters that are in most antidepressants. And here's the crazy thing. We find what we look for. I can prove it. How many of you have ever dated someone where at the beginning of the relationship, you thought they could be the one. And everything they did was cute. The way they walked was cute. The way they talked was cute. The way they told stories, like, warmed your heart. But somewhere along the way, you figured out they were not the one. And everything they did drove you crazy. They walked too slow. They talked too fast. Watching them eat makes you nauseous. Anybody ever dated that person? How many of you are still married? <laughs> we find what we look for. The person didn't change, what we look for does. And when you train your brain to start looking for the good stuff, you start filtering out the negative. Have you ever seen a commercial for the medication where the side effects are worse than what it's treating? <laughs> so I need something for high blood pressure, but it could cause swelling, seizures, I don't know, vomiting, death, suicidal thoughts, right? If you die, get off the medication. That's what they tell you. But what if I told you that I could give you something that would do these things? It would make you feel better. It would make you look better. It would make you happier, healthier, and all around just better. Would you do it? What if I told you it was legal? Would you do it? No, but like seriously, I mean, I, I, want a, I want a commitment. If I told you that I can give you something that all you have to do is five minutes a day and it could make you feel better, look better, live longer, and be happier, would you do it? Yes. You promise? Yes. Pinky swear? Yes. All right, so I'll give you a hint. These people all swear by it. They won't go a day without it, and it is not collagen. <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess at what it is? Meditating and mindfulness. Now, I know everyone's like, ugh. And I used to be that person because my mind races a million miles a minute and I would sit there quiet and I would try to focus on my breath and all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, I forgot to email Natalie. Oh, what am I gonna have for dinner? I wonder why that girl looked at me funny. Do I have something in my teeth? Why does my leg itch? Oh, screw it, I'm done. And I would be done. And I thought that you had to go on like a week-long silent retreat and eat tofu and find your zen. But what I realized is that it can be done anytime, anywhere, and it doesn't cost a thing. And when you do it for just five minutes a day, it will change your life. So there I am going through the airport. Oh, and that's not even the best part. The best part is this is my actual birthday. We're at 24 Diner in downtown Austin. My husband said, I got you a birthday present, but it was before all this happened. And I'm like, okay, well, what is it? And he goes, I don't know if you're going to like it. I said, well, what is it? And he goes, we're going to see a comedian at the Paramount. That's what I said. But I did it, I went, because you know what, life's too short and you need to smile. And so we had seats in the back and I walked in and I kid you not, I had that over my eye, a boot on my foot and literally was like, hmm, <laughs> And apparently if you do this, they give you all kinds of stuff. I mean, <laughs> if you ever go to the airport, it totally works. You're like, security. <laughs> And they just let you right through. They're like, this girl's been through enough. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to do another experiment. I want you to raise your arm up in the air. It's hot in here, so hopefully everybody showered. <laughs> raise your arm. I want you to point your index finger at the ceiling. And I want you to pretend that there's a giant clock right above your head. And I want you to trace the second hand of that clock 
going clockwise to the right faster than a second hand would go, right? Now, while you're tracing it, I want you to bring it down to just below your chest. Now, what direction is it going? I'm a wizard. <laughs> clockwise. There's always people in the back. I don't get it. You're going to see people come over later. How is that possible? I didn't change direction. What changed? Your perspective. And sometimes that's what resilience is all about. It's choosing your perspective. So Evan, you know, I told you he goes to school for kids with emotional disturbances. And the teachers are wonderful. They're trained in behavioral interventions. There's still people up there. <laughs> I'll, I'll do tutoring after. Just <laughs> How many of you have kids? Do they ever behave so horribly you just want to give them bad advice? Like, strangers have the best candy. <laughs> Hey kids, if you see a dark van, jump in! <laughs> but here's the bottom line, our whole life is a learning opportunity. It's all one big chance to practice. And until we figure it out, we keep getting presented with the same lessons over and over. If there is someone who drives you nuts, you will be presented with all of the people like that person until you figure it out. And we are the common denominator. You know, my grandmother always told me to ask for feedback from people. She said, Annie, if enough people tell you you're tired, it's time to go lay down. She also said, if you act like an ass, don't be surprised if people try to ride. You guys have been wonderful. Thank you so much.